Hi there, and welcome to Authors and Dragons, a special New Year's interlude episode. Not our regular as scheduled game, not quite a side quest. We're going to do a kind of year in review thing, which is something we normally uh, reserve for our Mimic Chest, for our special patron-only podcast. Uh, but we figured, seeing as this was being released on New Year's Day, and you're all ready for a bright, shiny New Year, then we could uh, bitch about the old year for a bit on the main podcast and have some fun with that. Uh, firstly, who do we have with us here today? We have myself, Steve Weverell. We have Drew Hayes. We have Rick Wadkiri. We have... Ch- the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> that was the Don't you dare cut <laughs> Don't you I, I, deliver- I deliberately meant to butcher your name there, but I didn't think it was going to come out that hilariously. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> we also have John Hartness and Robert Bivon. <laughs> So, guys, uh, a year in review, what we normally do on the Mimic Chest is, uh, you know, we just talk about what's been pretty cool about 2019, media-wise. We talk about movies, TV shows, video games, anything we're kind of up to date with, and uh, what we want to see in the new year. But firstly, uh, how did everybody's 2019 go? Did you have a good time? (laughs) It was rocky. Just touch and go. <laughs> well, be, being, being that I'm just a clone of Bevan, uh, apparently in this too, ditto Ron the Rocky. <laughs> it, it was doing great until I had to spend, you know, $12,000 in home repairs in the last quarter of the year. So I might be going into 2020 a little twitchy and gun shy, but fuck it, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I, uh... Had a good twenty. Had a good twenty nineteen. Aside from the obvious uh, high that we all shared, not just the con. Uh, there were some wild mushrooms we tried after everybody was asleep. Uh, but that's that's its own story. Uh, this is a year I got nominated for like an award for the first time. So that was pretty cool. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, didn't win, but hey, that gives me something to make as a hallmark in another year. Yeah, you don't have to win. You just you've been nominated for an award. That's, I had an excuse uh, to go to New York. That was really, that was a neat ass experience. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty badass, dude. At Falstaff Books, we published over fifty books over in one year. That's incredible. Mm. That's ridiculous, and that Damn. doesn't count the two shingles titles that I put out. <laughs> <laughs> so, and why had... doesn't it count the two shingles titles? Well, those those aren't Falstaff books. Those aren't Falstaff. I, I, I know. <laughs> Because I don't share that money with the company I run. (laughs) So, yeah, 51 books in 52 weeks. And what were you doing for that other week, Slacker? (laughs) It hasn't started yet, bitch. (laughs) I think, did both of our Shingles audiobooks come out this year? Just because of the release delay? Uh, Or did one come out last year? Well, the important thing is that a Shingles audiobook collection came out. And uh, yes. and another is coming out in 2020. Mm, something to look forward At to. At least one more in 2020. At least one more in 2020. We, we've written, and they are publishing the next one in the in the series. Yeah, I, I mean, if they've published these, I, I can't see them not publishing future ones. Because what the hell are they thinking anyway? Well, yeah. let's not say that. <laughs> at, at some uh, point, listeners. at some point, somebody will wake up and be like, "Dear God, what have I done?" Well, let's be clear, listeners. The probably the reason we're still getting this is because even though these are weird, we have a great audience who is out there buying them, leaving reviews, and supporting them. So, if anything, the fact that this is still going is thanks to you folks. So, uh, thank it's you all sincerely. Your fault. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank even God even even leaving Sorry. reviews on Bob's book, which he keeps mentioning over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> I think I'm the one now who has the shingles book that needs more review love than anybody because I got the I did the last one. Oh yeah, because I bitched a lot and people finally uh, <laughs> left some reviews. Good on you, you guys. Bitched a lot and uh, Ian Grease. Kaplan ran a whole 24 days program to get us reviews. Yes, God yes. bless Ian Kaplan for that. That was wonderful. Go check out her stuff too. <laughs> E.M. Kaplan on Amazon, probably. Let's be honest. We, we yeah. know where the ebook market is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. I don't see that changing in 2020. Or indeed, ever. At this point, it'll be hard for anybody to come back and 
take the crown unless Amazon. I don't know. Unless I, he I gets really married and divorced again. I mean, he does that <laughs> a couple of times. I, w- I will say, I think the best shot right now that someone has is doing the thing that still only Amazon is really doing, um, and that's empowering the shit out of their indie authors. Like, as much as we all bitch about KU, KU is still the only version of itself that exists on any of these platforms. Like, yeah. it, it it sucks that, like, all the exclusivity stuff, but even if I wanted to do KU somewhere else, I don't have anywhere else that I could do a version of it. Like, and book streaming isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's more affordable for a lot of folks, and if you've got a bigger book, it does kind of pay out comparably. Yeah, I mean, the bo- the bottom line is most well, some of us have been waiting for for eight or more years for like the other platforms to take this shit seriously. And they haven't yet. And I mean, yeah. I know some people could be like, well, yeah, I, I make, I make money on Kobo. Congratulations. You and maybe one other person. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah. but yeah, I mean, the thing is for even when Amazon half asses it and Amazon half asses a lot, let's be perfectly honest, but half legit yeah, every yeah, day, but half assing something is better than no assing it at all. Which is like, you know, which pretty much if you look at uh, if you look at Google Play, if you look at the Amazon I, or like uh, Apple iBooks and stuff tends to be the case. It, it Every other industry seems to just try and suck the dick of professional publishing harder, um, even though like there's a whole competition of the indie that is generating profit. What, regardless of whatever you think of quality authors finding their opportunity, etc., money is being made, and these are companies. Yeah, and it's weird that they don't. It's like, oh come on! It's like you just want to ignore the giant fucking oil spill in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we do, but you know, yeah, I'm. I don't love Amazon's market share, but I'm also a little annoyed that it. No one's really even tried to come for them on this side. Right. Even the companies yeah. that have come forward with the resources to do so. If Google wanted to make a fucking run at it, Google could make a fucking run. Yeah, that speaking of no assing it, what Google Play books? Jesus. That's like negative fuck, assing it. Yeah. It's <laughs> minus ass. Like trying yeah. to pick your nose with your little toe to upload a goddamn book to that format. And don't get me started on trying to get paid. Fucking, I don't even think about Google Books as a thing. I, I only genuinely think forgot about it existed. Them when I get an email once a month saying, you need to update this and this or we can't pay you. And I think, <laughs> you owe me 77 cents. <laughs> Fuck it. It's not worth the time. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, Google, it's like, oftentimes Google, it seems like they've gone out of their way to make their store as unfriendly as possible. I mean, don't even get me started on that bullshit thing of no matter what price you put it at, we're going to discount your books. So just so just, just for the sheer fact that it will piss off Amazon and screw up your career. That alone, like (laughs) that alone probably has kept countless, uh, you know, authors from like, you know, from joining just because of that extra headache. And, and fucking Apple could hundred percent make a run at it because the Apple store interface is good. They know how to sell a digital product and no, yeah. no mm-hmm. fucks given. And then, and then Kobo, which Kobo's when they came out, they basically were like, Hey guys, you know, we're actually going to hire Indies to like, you know, help us build this store for you. And somehow and even, I guess, yeah. <laughs> I guess they didn't hire the right ones. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna comment on that because I know I know I know some of the people involved, but it's like, it's like you you're not wrong. It's kind of like okay, guys, you put this out here, you made a lot of promises, and not a single one came true. <laughs> and then Kobo signed a deal with Walmart to sell eBooks through Walmart's online store, and nothing. So yeah, until somebody gives a shit, Amazon's gonna be. The 8,000 pound gorilla. Yeah. You know, what's funny is you mentioned the Apple thing. My go-to e-reader is an iPad mini. Uh, that's my favorite, like fits, lighting, etc. That's how easily I could transition over. Yeah. If Apple had an ebook store, I already use their product with the Kindle app as my go-to reader. Me too. I read on my iPad every day and it's a hundred percent the device I use. Yeah. And when I get things on submission, I, I don't convert them to an EPUB to read in Apple's iBooks. 
I convert it to a Mobi and upload it to my Kindle account to read on my iPad. Yep. Well, this isn't really a year in review, but hey, we did... uh... (laughs) If, no, if, it's, if you get it. enough authors together and talk about the past, we are going to bish about Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Everybody who's ever wondered what it's like when a bunch of uh, authors get together at a con or like behind closed doors, it was this, this conversation. <laughs> well, yeah. before we get too Only. negative, let me, let, me just, let me just say that we're bitching about the other stores here, but this is more like a plea to the other stores. It's like if you just like acted like you cared – we would flock to you in droves because, you know, as Drew said, it's like KU is kind of the only like, you know, is kind of like the only game in town. I don't want to be exclusive. I would love for my books to be on every friggin' store. We're not yeah. happy that Amazon has this much market control either. We're not. But going wide is just a thing that's like, well, I guess I want to make less money for yeah. no reason. 25% of it to my the man. gross revenue in 2019 was through KU. I believe that. And and f- readers love it with good reason. I'm a voracious reader too. I get the $10 and like you can just churn. And and I like it because I do get paid through it. Um, if not for the exclusivity, I would really love Kindle Unlimited as a system. The exclusivity is Same the here. only thing that pisses yeah. me off about it. I love it as a reader, and I love it because now when my friends release something, and I don't have to email them and say, hey, I'm a cheap ass, can you send me a copy? I just go and I get it on Kindle Unlimited, and they get paid, and I don't feel like a cheap ass. I am, though. <laughs> the exclusivity would piss me off if uh, yeah, I tried going wide early on and uh, just didn't sell any books anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, doesn't the... I, mean, I know I won't sell books elsewhere, but I would like for them to be yeah. available. Oh, elsewhere. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. I guess, you know, it bothers me a little bit uh, on principle, but, um, yeah, you know, I'm a pragmatic kind of guy, and uh, well, yeah, I don't really yeah, give a yeah. shit. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, we have like to stay me, You don't have any fucking mm-hmm. principles. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it's hard not to justify it because it makes your readers happier um, because it gives, like, the majority of them – who are going to use Amazon. Some of them are going to be on KU. So they're going to be happy to see it on KU. Um, It's not like someone who can't buy it from a Barnes and Noble outlet. Can't just install a Kindle app on their phone and still have access. It's, it's just so hard to justify from any angle, not doing it except from fuck. I hate that Amazon keeps this power. (laughs) But here's the thing. I don't think, I mean, I know they like to say exclusive or so, but I mean, the reality is it wouldn't hurt I don't think it would hurt Amazon in the least because I know I'm going to put my my advertising dollars where they matter most which you know even if I'm all over the place and still in KU if KU is bringing that money in that money my advertising dollars are going to KU. <laughs> I honestly yeah, I think it would be a bigger move for Amazon to get rid of the exclusivity and just be like no fuck it post it somewhere else charge $5 but it's still free here motherfuckers. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's a swing and dick move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my opinion on the entire matter is informed entirely by my laziness. I don't want to go wide because that means I have to do more stuff. So I want basically all the books to be owned by Amazon, all the television to be owned by yeah. Disney, and uh, everything else to no. be owned by Pornhub. I'll, I'll agree with you, Steve, because <laughs> ever since I went exclusive, that is the one thing I like about exclusivity is that it is a shit ton less work for me to like, you know, put out like 15 different versions of, uh, of a book, <laughs> especially with my catalog. Now I remember fucking with the old Barnes and Noble store before I gave up on them and like trying to get my files just right to Jerry rig it through that system. Jesus Christ. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, I finally switched over to using an aggregator. I used draft to digital to send it everywhere for the very few things that I still have that are wide that we publish. See, um, I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm a cheap motherfucker. So I want that extra 5% in my pocket, not that draft two digitals. I, I'm an insane control freak. So I have to have gone through every single chapter link and everything on every version to make sure it's all clicking and working before I feel comfortable. So never an option for me. The crazy sp- doesn't allow it. 51 <laughs> books. Yeah. In yeah. I a year. also <laughs> not a publisher. 
<laughs> yeah, but even, but even so, most most of us, I mean, you know, I know my catalog, my my personal catalog is in like the 30s at this point, you know, with like novels and stuff. And yeah, I mean, if if suddenly Amazon dropped the exclusivity thing tomorrow, yeah, I would put my books wide, but it would take me a fuckload of time to get those books. <laughs> Oh god, yeah, yeah. I would literally just find some fucker on Fiverr and say, <laughs> "Here, I will pay you a, po- a bucket of money. Here are the files. Make it happen." Yeah, I'm, I'm with Drew on this one. I'm a control freak, so so this would be like a di- that that would be like a lost week for me. <laughs> it would be a lost month for you because you're probably the fucker I'd hire. <laughs> <laughs> Because I want somebody that's that level of control freak because I'm 100% not that person. So if you're out there and your New Year's goal is to start a platform that offers indies enough juice that it genuinely rivals Kindle as a platform, uh, reach out. Let some motherfuckers know. Uh, we, uh, We might be interested. Yeah. And that's, you know, looking to the year ahead as opposed to the year behind. Wink, wink. (laughs) <laughs> oh, wait, were we doing something other than bitching about Amazon on this episode? So if your New Year's resolution is to take on Amazon, <laughs> then uh, well done, ballsy move. I was going to try and drop a gene size, but, you know, it just seems you know, petty. You know, I think it would be easier to make my New Year's resolution to marry and then divorce Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> Way ahead of you, mate. Already uh, pulling a Bugs Bunny on that one. <laughs> the real trick would be getting around the prenup. He has to have learned his lesson. Uh, mm. He does look a bit like Elmer Fudd now, I think about it. Yeah, you're not wrong on that one. So do most of us. Yeah. <laughs> speak, speak for yourself, Rick. I mean, Bob. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> All right, year in review. <laughs> All right, yeah, year in review. What do we want to start with? It seems to me, I don't know, we've had some exciting movie events, but it seems to me that television is probably the more interesting thing to talk about. So we'll start with movies. Hmm. What was everybody's right. big movie of 2019? Uh, it wasn't any of the... My favorite movie of the year wasn't the big ones. I mean, I saw Endgame. I want to go see the new Star Wars, but... My favorite movie of the year was, God damn it, what's it called? Bad Times at the El Royale. Oh, that was good. That was it good had one. every fucking body in it, and they mm. shot everything, and everything exploded. Well, there you go. That's a, that's a I mean, sterling the endorsement. the fuck else do I want? Well, mm. boobs, but sure. Um, it was real early in the year, so I think a lot of people have forgotten about it, but Us was really good. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I heard that was brilliant. You know, I didn't watch I, it because I don't watch scary. Movies. I, I just saw that recently, and I thought I thought it was pretty good, but I'm not I'm not sure yeah. it would uh, would make my top ten. To be honest, yeah, I was expecting something pretty big because uh, you know he was coming off another major movie win, and the trailer looked like it was going to be mind blowingly out of this world, and it was, but just maybe not as yeah. much as I built it up in my head about. But it was very, very fun yeah. movie, very cool concept. Yeah, and on, honestly, well I saw the, the 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 twist at the end. I saw coming in the first five minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, almost as soon as it was set up. Yeah. But I don't mind that, you know. I, that's that's <laughs> I'm sort a of lazy man, Rick. <laughs> And also, it is always, like, a little hard to be like, okay, the problem with doing this job is you get very used to looking at stories as, like, okay, that is pointing Mm -hmm. to that, is pointing to that. Like, structurally, we dig into the guts of them so much, it's hard not to kind of look at them as components. And so, yeah, it was obvious, but, you know, good foreshadowing should be seeable if you're really paying attention. Speaking of obvious twists, um, I really enjoyed the Joker movie. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> while thinking it was entirely like not a good Batman story at all because it doesn't really make sense once you try and sort of insert it into a Batman world. But uh, as a movie, as a performance, and as kind of a, a directorial funk, yeah, I really enjoyed that. But there was a moment in there where there was a twist that I'd seen was going to be a twist as soon as it was set up. And they made a really big thing about it, like, oh, motherfucker, this was a twist. <laughs> yeah, man. 
You don't need to hold my hand. This is, you know, you wanted to We've do an R rated movie. Taxi Driver and uh, <laughs> King of Comedy. It's okay. We know this movie already. Um, no, so weirdly, Steve, when you started in on that, I have no idea why in my head this happened, but you're like, speaking of obvious twists that we all saw coming, I definitely, for some reason, thought you and I were on the same vibe and, we're, and you were going to say Detective Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> Went a different direction. <laughs> All right. Um, Detective P. Juke, Joker. Oh, you're right. Okay. Maybe not the same page. Yeah, All right. Yeah. All right. I was thinking I didn't actually see any 2019 movies, but uh, I saw Detective Pikachu. So. Oh, right. well done. Excellent. Pretty, pretty fun movie, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to choose that as mine because I don't remember seeing any other ones. Detective Pikachu, I choose yeah. you. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna be one of the sheeple and go big budget and say Godzilla King of the Monsters because as a Godzilla fan since I was two years old, it gave me every single fucking thing I wanted to see in a Godzilla movie. Fuck, has Godzilla been around that long? Well, I was check reviews. You're definitely not with the crowd. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, Hart, 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 you're not making my top, my my top favorite person of 2019 right now. <laughs> I'm not even making your top ten list on this podcast, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I I wanted to see the Godzilla movie. It looked like they'd finally found their speed with Godzilla, but I just haven't got around to it yet. I have to say, I've been let down by Godzilla movies, uh, pretty much. Every Godzilla movie that's been released uh, this side of the ocean has been a great big disappointment to me. So I wasn't in a hurry to see it. You know, every single critique of this movie came down to people who were like, well, the human characters weren't very interesting. To which it, it just tells me, then obviously you're not a Godzilla fan. Because any Godzilla fan will tell you, I don't give a flying fuck. Kill every single human yeah. in the movie and focus on the monsters destroying things. That's really all I want. You know? Yeah. The only purpose of the human is to give some sort of scale to the Godzilla. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't know. I would, for picking a movie for 2019, it would be tempting to go for Joker. But as much as it was an obvious homage to its influences, I still think it was one of the more interesting movies to come out of the year. And uh, but I think possibly the most interesting movie, and possibly the most emotionally kind of confusing movie to me was jojo rabbit hmm. has anyone seen that i have not I yet i it's want to just magical. have not gotten to mm, it is the yeah. most heartwarming film about nazis i've ever seen <laughs> that, that's my uh how long is hitler that was list? a delight and that's not something i thought i'd ever say <laughs> in a review podcast but i'm going to put it out there hitler was an absolute charmer in this movie Played Is by there Taika a lot Waititi. of competition on the list of <laughs> most heartwarming Nazi flicks? Yeah, there is. There's like I mean, one spot. That and, and the producers. <laughs> oh, yeah, the producers. All right, there's two. Uh, okay, yeah. No one's going to believe me uh, until they, they're just going to think I lost my mind. But, yes, um, for a little Nazi boy, a little hateful, bigoted Nazi boy who has Hitler as an imaginary friend, is uh, the most adorable thing to hit cinemas in 2019. Sad, poignant, uh, interesting, and a hell of a directorial swing by Taika Waititi with some wonderful performance by Scarlett Johansson, playing uh, not a Japanese woman, but a Nazi. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was great. It was uh, it is a, a film that's going to be talked about for a long time, not just because it's kind of emotionally confusing. And difficult to give a positive review about without sounding a bit like a psychopath. I thought you were saying Scarlett Johansson as a Japanese Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know what movie I will give like a shout out to? Because it's not often you see a good sequel, let alone a good comedy horror sequel. Happy Death Day to You. Hmm. Uh, sequel to what was already a weirdly good uh, movie happy death day and it yeah. was fucking really fun the sequel knew what it was doing it it played with and against your expectations and it managed to churn out an honestly good movie uh built off the first it was surprising i was not prepared for i mean it's still a sequel but it's a pretty damn good sequel like if you liked the first one, you will like the second. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because that's been on HBO for like a like a couple like a month or two now, and I've been meaning to like watch it. But each time, like you know, it's like no, I'll watch this movie instead or so. 
but uh, I'll, I'll try. To- that first one felt like lightning in a bottle, so you're like hesitant to see if they recapture mm. it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, God, that mm. that uh, that lead actress. Oh goodness, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. But she's fantastic. Like that character should not work as well as she does. But that that actress does such a good job, like with the humor and the heart and the sass and the just. I don't know. She builds a great character. So I'm looking at the highest grossing films of the year, and I realized that out of the top ten, I saw one, Ooh. two, two. <laughs> Endgame and Captain Marvel, and that's it. It was a good year for superhero movies. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the new Spider-Man movie. I thought I was kind of done with Marvel after Endgame, and then. Oh, wait Spider-Man a minute. Was Into the Spider-Verse this year? Nope. 2018, very end, Christmas. Oh, wow. I, I double-checked because I was like, there's no way I didn't talk about this last year, right? <laughs> I think we talked about it, yeah. I'm sure we did. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about it again because that movie was fucking fantastic. Oh, mm. it, it, fuck, yeah. Well, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, it's got to be a sequel to that coming out soon, oh. surely. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I got in, I got into it on Facebook like er, earlier this year because I was complaining about the, about that movie, and a bunch of people jumped on. I guess they thought I was like you know being racist against Mil- Miles Morales, and I was like, no, no, no. My problem with it is entirely that they used Kingpin as like the main bad guy, <laughs> <laughs> and like immediately they just like stopped. They're just like nerd, go away. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, this is not the fight I thought I was yeah. I was getting into. <laughs> yeah. Average, put that popcorn back in the microwave. Uh, how have none of us mentioned John Wick 3? I haven't uh, seen, I haven't it, seen it. it. I um, Well, there you go. That's how. Was that better than 2? Because I was kind of let oh, down yeah. by 2. No, yeah, 2 was not that good. 3 came back strong, All right, man. well, I might be watching that tonight, then. I'll take that. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 yeah. that right? I, guess. I haven't seen 2. I mean, 3 came back kicking all kinds of ass. Okay, cool. I'm in Bevan's camp, yeah. I was let down by two of it. That was on every taxi door in Korea. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that... that I, I I also was... I think we all, like, two were like, oh, okay. Boy, yeah. Th- the opening of three, like, really just tells you, like, all right, motherfuckers, we know what you're here for, and you're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I know the movie, and I love it already. <laughs> all right. I can't. <laughs> Nice. But yeah, I mean, an excellent year for superhero movies all around. I'm not sure. I know they've got a lot of ambitious stuff for the MCU on Disney Plus and all kinds of new movies. I don't know if I've got the emotional energy to start that up again. Uh, uh, we'll I see. do. <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking of superhero movies, we, uh, we had a, a little hiccup a technical hiccup when we were trying to watch Endgame um uh with uh at the movies and um you know just in case we ever wanted to do that again I haven't watched it with my kids yet so <laughs> uh wow I did not realize that I definitely thought you would have uh seen it by now oh no I, I didn't care and I think my kids have seen it <laughs> independently of me oh. I'm just saying uh if we ever want to do that I I'm still a in-game virgin. There we go. I think uh, be uh, listeners, experience. let us know. Uh, would you like an episode of At the Movies where Robert Bevan watches Avengers Endgame for the first time? I sure fucking would. I, <laughs> yeah. I really yeah. want to make that yeah, happen. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm voting for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, we should really stress the point that he probably hasn't seen any of the Marvel movies, and the ones that he has, he's probably forgot. So... Yeah, I saw the, the one that's a sequel to, right? What was that? Yeah, one? you saw Infinity War, right? Infinity War, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you didn't know oh, what the yeah. hell was going on in Infinity War. I knew there were people fighting. <laughs> oh, we're fucking and doing there's this. There's a big yeah. purple guy we're with a fucked up chin. <laughs> and a big glove. He <laughs> does have a big glove, yeah. That's it. That oh, it. yeah. Relevant. Yeah, uh, the, uh, this is happening. <laughs> There's a uh, brand from the Groonies. My new favorite movie of 2019 is the Avengers Endgame with Robert Benton on commentary. <laughs> I'm calling it now. We should just get in touch with the Russo brothers and sell them this audio track for the Blu-ray. Just trust us, guys. You want this <laughs> in your life. <laughs> the special edition in 10 years. 
Oh, man. <laughs> you never know if any of us sell some books and get famous enough. To do a commentary track on a movie we know nothing about. <laughs> yeah, imagine if you fired up Crawl and there was a special edition commentary in which Stephen King is on there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you'd be like, you "What pick... the fuck?" And also, yes. <laughs> it's weird that you pick that one because Richard Cadry was just on Twitter yesterday saying, "I've never seen Crawl. Should I watch Crawl?" Fuck yeah! And then today he's on Facebook saying. So I watched Crawl. Have we done Crawl on At The Movies? Uh-uh. No, we, no, haven't. we haven't done it. We did Hawk the Slayer, which is the we thinking the man's Slayer. Crawl. By the way, I've I've also never seen Crawl, so... Ditto. Mm. Oh, then, then we gotta do Crawl. <laughs> we gotta do Crawl. Yeah. I can't believe we haven't done Beastmaster yet. Oh, there's so many bad movies we can do. Yeah, yeah, we really... We got some fun ones uh, coming in 2020, folks. Yeah, I was gonna say we, we, we will Stay all be tuned. long dead before we like you know, we run out of bad movies to look at. <laughs> no, we will not. TV, sure. Uh, what, yeah, what next, I think, Steve? I think we put movies to bed there. I think we yeah. picked some good ones. It's been a good year generally. Some interesting ones, some big budget ones. But I still think the more interesting stuff has happened with the continuing dominance of streaming television. Mm. So, guys, what was your TV show event of 2019. Oof. All right. The Boys. That's oh, a good, yeah. choice. good Very choice. Very good choice. I mean, so I... Still yeah, haven't I, watched that one yet. All right. Don't be put off by the trailers, because I thought it was going to be a lot of macho teenage wank. And it kind no. of... Like a lot of Garth Eddie stuff. But it is kind of... Uh, it kind of is, but in a really good way. It's a lot more thoughtful and... Uh, polished and human than you'd think from the trailer i would really hope so i mean so one i'm i'm not really going to watch it this year no matter what because i'm writing villains code 2 and the subject matter just kind of skews a little too close i like to yeah. kind of avoid that when i'm working in the genre so it would be an after thing for me and then two to be honest the trailers made it look like absolute dog shit to me um yeah it really looked like it was more of that nihilism, everybody's an asshole thing. It's like, I'm so fucking tired of that lazy, lazy, cheap thematic writing. Like, put some fucking work in, man. Humans have reasons. Yeah. I mean, there was a, it was the same with Garth Ennis in general. His comic book stuff is edgy boy stuff. And it's, he's great. He's really good at it. But I'm kind of, I was reading Preacher and eventually I just go, yeah, calm down, mate. I'm probably a about 20 years too old to read this and enjoy it but the actual adaptations of his work have been really good at kind of toning down his excesses while maintaining the kind of uh i guess punk rock attitude of what he does and uh, the yeah. boys is no exception in fact might yeah. be the the finest yeah. definition of somebody raining in is a, and it's just enough. Yeah, it's like they, it's like they found a, they found a, like a showrunner, so basically it was like let's take this, but let's humanize it just enough to make it awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think the boys is a better adaptation than Preacher. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably hmm. check it out eventually when I finish doing the writing and everything. I've heard great things about it, but yeah, a lot of uh, I, that whoever cut that first trailer, I don't think did them any favors. No, it was uh, it was. It was not the product that was advertised in that trailer at all, and I'm very glad of that. It was to it was to a degree, but not like you know it not like the over overall. There's like there's a lot there. Hmm. Yeah, I mean it's like uh, the trailer felt like. How do you remember that fucking A Team movie they did, which just felt like the entire thing was just on cocaine. Hmm. And, and uh, I can't even remember what the A Team was about the movie it just seemed to be like four hollywood guys screaming their way for a bad script <laughs> and uh when i watched the boys I thought, yeah i thought the boy oh there's got to be more of that more of this yeah we're all guys and we're having a great time and we're off our face on coke <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no it was a uh, much less of a you know a disastrous a bachelor party than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So. yeah, I think I enjoyed it a bit more. Like, like I enjoyed the Umbrella Academy, but I think I enjoyed the boys a bit more. Oh, yeah, that's that's a tough yeah. one, actually, because that's a good contender as well. The Umbrella Academy was kind was of like... Was this a, year? I think so. Was it this year? Oh, oh no, you might, be, um, you might be wrong. Let me just Google that sucker. 
So I'll throw out, um, I think I hit most of the major ones, but I'll, I'll throw out some of the more obscure stuff. Uh, Infinity Train yeah, this year. was a really cool one. It was uh, this year. Umbrella Academy was this yep. year? It was this year. Nice. It counts. I caught, yeah. That, I did catch that one because I've already read that book, so I was pretty comfortable with it. Um, that's a pretty, that was a pretty fun one. Yeah, it's like superheroes by way of Judd Adaptow. It was yeah. good. Um, so Infinity Train, it was a limited run uh, animated series. Uh, it was 10 episodes, like 15 minutes, sort of uh, over the garden wall in terms of um, amount and structure. Um, mm. But very weird, very kind of fun. Um, it's a very interesting, I don't know. I like, uh, if you liked Over the Garden Wall, there's a good chance you'll like Infinity Train. Um, and that's all I really want to say about it. Cause just like with Over the Garden Wall, a lot of the fun is in the discovery. I think my top one was, uh, and, and there's never going to, and there's not going to be any more cause Netflix already fucking canceled it. But I really enjoyed the fuck out of Daybreak. It just. Uh-huh. Wait a second. Which one was Daybreak? Daybreak, Daybreak. The 80s one. Yeah, it was kind of like the 80s meets like zombie apocalypse and stuff. Oh, God. Oh. I saw like the first two episodes of that and it hurt my soul. I hated it so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, be, being, the, being the anti-Bevan, it like spoke to my soul. So that's probably why I liked it. Oh, God. I was like, oh, this. what are they trying to do? Oh, they're trying so hard and they're failing so hard. Oh, God. See, it, it was, it was kind of like they had... Uh, they had a list and they were going down and they had to check them all off. I liked it. I didn't hate it. I didn't. I was very meaty. I was very meh on it. It it made me laugh. So I was I was very happy with it. I haven't checked out yet. I'm going to based on Rick and Bevan's recommendations. <laughs> I'm going to have to check out. Yeah, I missed this one totally. And uh, that the, what what different thoughts? <laughs> it's. For me, it was kind of like Scott Pilgrim versus the zombie apocalypse. Except Scott Pilgrim worked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, they had Edgar Wright in their corner. Scott Pilgrim was a difficult thing to pull off if you're not Edgar Wright. Uh, Yeah, I was just about to say TV event of the year was a huge and succulent wave of disappointment (laughs) in the final Game of Thrones season. Oh, God. Oh, God. Like butter, it was to me. <laughs> I was so glad I didn't get into game. That's been like a pain in the ass for years and years of not being part of that culture, and then suddenly this year. <laughs> oh, you'll uh, hate it, Daddy, you nerds. It, well, I still yeah, like getting it. back getting back to your like your your butter uh, analogy. It was like it was like being lubed up for like seven years, and then somebody putting on a sandpaper condom. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus. Uh, I do agree the final season should have been about three seasons to get to where they got to. But uh, you know what? I'm still happy I was along for the ride. Yeah, the ride was fun. Mm. The mm-hmm. destination, it, destination was, sucked. Yeah, the dude. destination was the, the closed Wally world. <laughs> <laughs> the ride was fun. The ending was disappointing. Name of my sex tape. It's a very good object lesson for younger writers who don't think endings are that important. Um, (laughs) This is how important it is to stick the landing. The creators that everyone praised as geniuses for like seven seasons are now basically considered the town fuck ups. Exiled into the desert. Oh, we made our Star Wars movie. Sure, you fucking did. (laughs) Didn't they have to cancel their appearance at Comic-Con because they knew they were just going to get fucking railed. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, they're still acting as if they have clout and maybe they do to some people, but it's like, talk about watching a reputation completely invert itself. And, and and HBO is, yeah, they can't even point at HBO because HBO is like, we will keep throwing money at you as long as you want to do this shit, you know? And they were like, no, no, we'll do uh, we'll, we'll just do it this way. George R.R. R. Martin was like, well, you know, I, I'm not planning on finishing this anytime soon. Why are you guys in such a hurry? <laughs> it definitely has the feel of like they saw greener pastures and rather than fully finish what they were working on before moving to those greener pastures, we're like, ah, OK, we're done with this shit now, right? Mm. I mean, they were like, I've got too much money in my bank account now. <laughs> I need to, uh, you know, find. I need to find some balance in my life. You know, I woke up and I think I'm too well liked by nerds. Let me, let Mm. me burn that shit. (laughs) 
Or maybe he just woke up and just went on the internet and went, oh, holy shit. Nerds are all a bunch of cunts. I'm getting out of this game. <laughs> and Jar Jar sits on the throne. <laughs> that honestly would have probably been a better end if Jar Jar Binks had risen from the same fight. I can respect that. Oh, God, yeah. If it ended with Jar Jar on the Iron Throne, at least people would have been talking about how shocking it was. <laughs> Not how bad it was. At least that would have been like, you know... A fuck you that people could have laughed about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> who who wins? Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> you gotta uh, give the audience the, the finger. You, you go ahead and do it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like sweet wine that tears are to me. <laughs> I don't know why those creators just didn't lead into it. <laughs> just like fuck you, you nerds. Why don't you go outside? <laughs> Go play some fucking football. Talk to a girl. <laughs> Talk to a girl, nerd boy. <laughs> Sit there waiting for the book that's never going to come. You know, uh, to be fair, I started reading all the books after I'd finished the TV show, and I thought the TV show handled the characters and actual plot quite well, considering what a fucking shotgun approach George R. R. Martin takes to plot lines. <laughs> I mean, he just he just shits out a plot line, and he just kind of goes somewhere, and then but he's too busy shitting out the next plot line. So you know, they're, they're a wonderful chaotic mess. I could not put them down. I love those books, but at the same I time, think... trying to adapt that shit for any realistic television series, I think deserves a lot of respect. So I would also say, but that's the benefit of getting to adapt when you're six books deep, is you know what goes nowhere, and you know what's important. So you can just be like, oh, okay, snip this, snip this, Ooh, well, we work this into this. Like it's it's working from a rough draft. Yeah. It's a lot did, easier to polish than it is to create. Did you read the books? No, I read no. the first one, did not care for uh, George's writing style. Nothing against the man, it's just a matter of, of taste. His leans a little more high fantasy, which is not my uh, preferred reading. It's it's kind of like uh, he just spawns plot points. <laughs> you know, like if you had a spawning enemy in a video game, but you just didn't kill any of the enemies? Eventually, get really fucking stressful. That's what Game of Thrones is. So I can see what you're saying. The advantage of it being six books deep, but it's six books deep, and it is nowhere near uh, close to resolving fucking anything. So it's kind of a. I appreciate what they did with the show. Uh, I don't think well, that was sort of the anything. issue. Is they adapted just fine, but when they had to resolve, it all went to shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I do not envy anyone that has. Anyone <laughs> who's read the books will uh, will know what I'm talking about. But yeah, can't wait for the next book. I'm sure. I'm sure there's no pressure yeah. there at all, George. <laughs> and and, <laughs> I, and I hope you're really your fucking patient, it, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> just the last two pages of your book in really big type. Go outside. <laughs> and then uh, instead of the end just go outside you nerd yeah. boy <laughs> that's my advice for George R.R. Martin just taking a, a leaf out of his showrunner's playbook maybe not, not even words just like a, just a picture of him giving a dual bird <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your money sucker <laughs> <laughs> so yeah well I'd say that was a TV event of the year I don't know if it's anybody's favorite TV event of the year. Yeah, I mean, you're uh, not all events are good things. Uh, mm, yeah. <laughs> you are. I mean, the Hindenburg, that was an event, you know. It was an event. <laughs> well, you know, all prayers are answered. Sometimes the answer is go fuck yourself, but they're all answered. The Holocaust was an event. And we know Steve's a big fan of Hitler now. <laughs> <laughs> You go watch Jojo Rabbit. And, uh... <laughs> I So I, I'll throw one. Uh, this was sort of a, a TV event to, I don't know how many of us were left, but um, I really liked Suits when it came out. Um, uh, I like to watch it when I'm traveling. It Final season was this year, and it was a pretty satisfying ending. They brought back small characters. They paid off small plot lines. They, uh, you know, let people who wanted to ride off in the sunset ride off in the sunset it was a it was a nice one i just thought i'd throw out a mention for like the 10 other people who were still watching suits at this point <laughs> yeah i've seen i thought I've that watched finished some ages of ago. it and i enjoyed it but yeah i thought it was over like five years ago 
somehow they went on for two seasons after losing what was arguably one of the main characters. Um, because when, um, oh my goodness, I just keep thinking of her name, Rachel Zane, in the show. I have completely blanked on um, the actress's name. She married a royal prince. Um, oh goodness. It's a very famous woman. I cannot oh, believe yeah. I'm blanking on this. I should probably know her name. But yeah, don't. Steve, what the fuck? I don't give a shit. I'm a, I'm a Republican at heart. <laughs> uh, but, but Meghan Markle. Jesus. Wow. I can't believe I could not remember that. Oh. So, yeah, Meghan Markle played Rachel Zane. And so when uh, she got married, she left the show. And so Mike's character did, too. But they still put up two pretty good seasons afterward, which was shocking. Bunch of unelected sponges. <laughs> That's what I uh... <laughs> uh Okay. Right, so Suits. I'm surprised that didn't finish five years ago, so I'm going to call that a TV event. Uh, does anybody else have another favorite? I mean, there's two uh, yeah, I've got that one. I really want to talk about, but you know, oh, um, you mentioned them yet. Since I don't um, watch a whole lot, I'll, I'll, I'll get in mine. Um, and I'm, I'm looking it up now to make sure that it was in 2019, but yeah. They had a uh, season three you. of uh, Santa Clarita Diet. Ooh, that's a good one. That was fun. I just I love that show. I, I like watching uh, Timothy Oliphant being goofy. Yeah, he's, he's really great. Yeah, he is just so wonderful in that in that role. Yeah, I enjoy the entire cast, the entire core cast. But I would yeah. say by season three, you could tell they were kind of didn't really know where they were going, and I wasn't that enamored by the other characters they were bringing in. But I still enjoyed it. Just yeah, I didn't care. I cast. just uh, yeah. watching them is fun. <laughs> yeah. if you just put a camera on. Timothy Olyphant, Olyphant, Elephant, just follow him around with a camera for a bit. That's kind of like our podcast, uh, like how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, we don't have a plot. We're just Um, fun. Yeah. And charming. (laughs) Just fun and charming. We're basically Timothy Timothy Olyphant. Charming is exactly the word that everybody (laughs) thinks of when they think of us. Well, you know, I once saw a kitten shit in the middle of a kitchen floor, and I thought, you know, it's charming in its way, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's not nice. Obviously, it wasn't your floor. <laughs> yeah, well, no, yeah. yeah. You're at a house party and some of these animals just in the floor. You're like, ah, that's delightful. I don't have to clean it up. But uh, that might just be me. Anybody, some, somebody change the subject from animals shitting on people's floors. Uh, no, I'm not, that, I'm not that guy. Oh, I, have a, I have a TV related event of 2019. I got to go to the Good Place set this year. Oh, oh yeah, you that's did. right. It's kind of like Mecca for you, isn't it? <laughs> it really was. And this is uh, the last year of The Good Place. They are up to the ending. There's a finale, but that comes after the new year. So we're going to see how they land. So far, it's really good. But yeah, getting to go to the Universal Studios and like walk around the set and take pictures. They let us uh, They let us into the building where you could take a picture of the yogurt board with like tons and tons and tons of all these different flavors that like someone had actually built and wrote and made even though you can really never see it on the show so yeah that was fucking awesome yeah that does sound good i do really like that show you can tell i know they're winding up now and that's fine i'll be sad to see it go but you know it's i'm uh, glad it it needed It always needed to be really expertly run. It didn't have the possibility of just kind of going forever. And so I'm... It's not the sort of thing they can just shit out a couple of seasons for because people still like it and uh, it still work. So, yeah, I'm glad they're kind of just wrapping up on their terms. I hope it closes strong and ends as like TV gold like it deserves. Like it, to me, it deserves to be like one of the great shows, but that is often determined by the ending. Ooh. No, I don't know. I'm Jar Jar different. takes the throne <laughs> in the good place. <laughs> Jar Jar takes the throne. <laughs> On a long enough timeline, nothing ends well. I know that's a depressing thought to take into 2020 with you, listeners. Hey, man. On a long enough timeline, nothing ends. Ooh. Cosmic. Yeah, let's go with well, that one. Everything that's more ends. positive. No uh, energy can't be destroyed, Bevin. It Just can only changes, change man. form. Just changes. <laughs> I think you'll find we're all eternal star children, so fuck you. <laughs> you are the same matter that's been drifting around the universe since the beginning. You're just in this combination today. 
Rick, are we the only ones who aren't fucking high? <laughs> I'm just thinking on a longer timeline. Yeah, I'm just backing uh, yeah. the fuck away from this one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let's not get off track. Um, Favorite fish song no. of 2019. <laughs> All right, that's as that's as good as my Gunther impression gets. <laughs> we'll save this for uh, A and D Con 2020. Gunther the, the impression. You are Gunther. <laughs> I was thinking that same thing. Hey, I, I like, have never sold drugs. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if anyone's gonna do an impression, you know, like, you're the only one who's ever been Gunther. <laughs> Did I ever show you my impression of Brandon Firemaster? <laughs> it's pretty convincing. It's the one impression I can do. <laughs> anyway, back on track. Television moments of 2019. Rick, you haven't uh, put your hand in the ring yet. Or oh, did you? Yeah. You did, yeah. Yeah, and then you the never shit yeah, on it. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the boys. I, no, I don't know. Oh, I wasn't the voice. That was John. It was, so. uh, <laughs> this was mine. The we shit on Rick. Shithole thing he <laughs> mentioned. I don't uh, even remember what Rick's was, and we shit on it. Oh, I, 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 haven't I seen remember it. the show. I don't remember what it was called. Days. Day, day, something day days. Break. Daybreak. Yeah. Anyway, I love the boys. <laughs> Uh, oh, have we all been then? Can I talk about the ones we should really be talking about that no one's talking about yet? Yeah, I think we were we were waiting for you to take the big ones. Fucking Mandalorian. Yeah, that's that's where I, I just yeah. I'm on number two. I started uh, actually today. I think I'm on number four. For some reason, even though it's not available in my country, I was kidnapped <laughs> by ruffians, <laughs> and uh, they ain't got standards. They haven't got the the rigid standards about pirating material that I have. So I, I banged the whole season. And I've got to say, I am fucking impressed. Mm. It's just a good show set in the Star Wars universe. No lightsabers, no ties to the movie. Some very obvious nods in places. It's just a really fun space western with that aesthetic that people still love, despite the fact it's, what, 40 years old now? 30 years old? I don't know. Uh, 40, 42. 40, 42 years oh, old. Damn. That 42 oh. year old aesthetic is not dead. Interesting things can be done with it. I have never really cared that much about Star Wars. Like, it's just a, it's a property to me. I don't have any emotional attachment to it. I missed it when I was younger. I've seen them all, but like, it, I don't know. I've just seen them all. They're just movies. Um, and so. I really like Mandalorian. I don't have a lot of the the attachments or the hang-ups, so to just watch just a straight-up Western um, mm. with a nice patina of some familiar stuff is pretty enjoyable so far. And it is a well-done Western. Yeah, I mean, there are places where I thought, oh, they're in the, the original cantina. Oh, that's where Han Solo sat when he shot Greedo. And I was kind of... But that wasn't integral to the understanding of anything that was going on. I kind of we could have just watched this with somebody who know fuck all about Star Wars and they could still had a good time. But for me, somebody who's very much in love with the original aesthetic of Star Wars, just the way everything looks. I've just always loved the junk pile spaceships and the uh the useless armor and, you know, the space farm voices. I've just always been very endeared to that. So Seeing that kind of polished up and respected and used to tell a tale that has nothing really to do with the movies everyone's busy arguing about was, uh, yeah, really refreshing. John Favreau, I don't think he gets enough credit for what he's done for nerd culture. I mean, dude basically kickstarted the MCU and has now just uh, quietly made the Star Wars universe a much more viable place to tell stories in. You know what I forgot he did until uh, a few days ago? Elf. Fucking modern Christmas oh, yeah. classic, too. You're right, yeah. yeah. I had no God, idea. I really don't like that movie. <laughs> I, I, we're aware of your opinions <laughs> on Elf. Rick, you All right, George. further evidence I'm not Rick. I, I like <laughs> Elf. And I fucking hate uh, Daybreak. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another one to maybe... I don't know if you guys have seen, but one probably to, to check out. Um, legally, of course, but uh, I don't know, have you guys any of you guys seen the Harley Quinn cartoon? I haven't. Is it good? You know something? It basically takes everything Harley Quinn and adds an R rating to it and complete batshit, and I'm it in. makes it awesome. <laughs> it's kind of fun. I've gotten to catch a few episodes, and it it's um, 
a lot more entertaining than I was expecting. Like I, I went in with standard DC cartoon expectations and, uh, somebody put work into the dialogue and that's rare enough. Hmm. Is it enough to take away the taste of that awful fucking suicide squad movie? Yes. Oh, it is. Yeah. Excellent. Good news. Definitely. Great news. I want to check out then. Well, if we're going to go for current shit, are we going to talk about the fucking Witcher? Yeah, that was the second big elephant in the room. I've just had the pleasure of watching I the mean, Witcher. I mean, look, Henry Cavill bulked up, but I wouldn't call him an elephant by any stretch. <laughs> well, not to his face. No, because um, he could fuck my <laughs> shit right up. Jesus, that guy's arms. This is something else I've been pleasantly surprised with because I've never played the games. They look like they take far too much effort. So I've never read the uh, books either. But now I think I'm going to do both because I really like this series. It's, you know, it's adult, but it's fun. How far into uh, it are you? Uh, just aced the whole thing today, yeah. actually, mate. I'm coming uh, down off of Witcher High. My wife and I watched the first episode last night. And, uh, I, I was interested, but I felt it was kind of slow. Does it? Does Pretty it much up? everyone has said the same thing. Oh, all right, the all right. Episode. It picks up yeah. in episode two. Good. Looking forward to it. I'm in the mm. exact same spot as Bob. I watched episode one and thought, huh, I wonder how this is going to be. Yeah. I mean, it's it's got some... It's just got some really basic, likable characters. Some cool shit happens. Yeah, there's some just, violence. There's some boobs. Yeah. There, there. I yeah. will say, oh, I will yeah. say, as you get past episode one, narratively, there are some parts where you look at and you're like, Jesus fucking Christ, <laughs> you know? Does it? Is, does it yeah. give me more of that that fight at the end? Like that action yes. was so tightly choreographed. I was like, yeah. But I had to get through so much other shit I didn't care about. <laughs> there's just a lot like of ass everything. kicking. There's a lot of ass world. kicking and magic and beautiful people being naked. So, you know, something Just for like everyone. everything in the world, once the bard shows up, shit gets way better. <laughs> oh, the bard is lovely. Yes. I, just, I don't think there's not a single character in this I don't like. There's so many interesting, colorful characters, yeah. but the bard yeah. who seems to be aware of his uh, own existence as a narrative device is just hilarious. <laughs> and if, and, if, you, and yeah. if you can leave that show without, like, you know, without singing the song to yourself, and you'll know oh the song God, when yeah. you hear it, you have no, you yeah. have no soul. Yeah. Oh, I'm really looking forward to continuing now. Christ, I was out <laughs> in a pub last night just drinking with friends, and I almost just started singing that out loud. And thought, <laughs> I can't do that. I'm not in a television show. <laughs> That would just, I would look insane if I did that. I mean, how given how popular know? that series is, you might have had a lot of people singing along. I don't know the fucking <laughs> song you're talking about, but. Oh, you will. Give it a week, week and I bet you would have a lot of people singing along. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, the two big fighty contenders happening quite recently Disney Plus is The Mandalorian. I'm very impressed with it. And it's not, it's not fucking reinventing the wheel at all, but it's just doing safe things very well and very enjoyably uh you could sit and watch that with your nephew or without your nephew or maybe rent someone else's nephew for the evening i don't know what your deal is <laughs> but it's very good and the witcher same thing except you can't really watch it with your nephew um, <laughs> it's a bit rude but again yeah not reinventing the wheel just some fun characters having some fun adventures uh we have a charming cast and a lot of the old ultra violence so and Henry Cavill has come out as a giant nerd. Yes. Well, like he was he, like, yeah, he really was into this project. He's like really into the property, isn't he? He car- he campaigned for the role off playing the video games. Mm. Oh. I saw an interview where he said that he missed the phone call from Zack Snyder offering him Superman because he was raiding in World of Warcraft. <laughs> And he Damn. couldn't be bothered to quit. And <laughs> I will say this about Henry Cavill as the Witcher. He really is a wonderful character mm. and he does do it very well. But a lot of other people have said this. Um, he sounds like an American doing a British accent, <laughs> even though he is British. Which, yeah, he's British. Yeah. But I think that is, is him being true to the character, but he does sound like he's doing a fake British accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Although, Steve, if you're going to play the video, you can probably skip straight to Witcher 3 for the video games because that is an awesome game. But the other, the the ones, the two before it, kind of stumble around a bit. Hmm. Oh, man. It is it is nice to see Henry Cavill uh, stretching his acting legs again. Like nothing, 
Nothing well. pissed me off the way that the man from Uncle did. Um, mm. If you haven't seen that movie, you should. It's really good. And Henry Cavill is amazing in it. And I was furious because I was like, you are this good. Where the fuck was this for Superman? Yeah, it's nice to see Henry Cavill actually giving a shit. <laughs> yeah, or I don't know, maybe not hamstrung by direct. Yeah. I, I don't uh, know what the yeah. deal is, but he is a fucking talent when he wants to be or when he's let to be. Yeah. And, oh, it's nice to see it again. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, I would say... Right off the bat, the things I'm looking forward to more in 2020, if we're going to get them, is more The Mandalorian and more The Witcher. But we'll see. That might not be till, I guess, 2021. I can wait, I suppose. No, I can't. I'm going to be furious <laughs> about this on the internet. For... You know, I do sort of like that um, The Mandalorian, even though I'm not going to experience it in the way uh, that it happened, I like that they did weekly releases. I like engaging with some of this tv that is on a weekly release schedule like the good place yes. as much as tangible is nice it's it's nice to have the ability to like be caught up and at the same plane as everybody without being done yeah i sort of missed that in fact i wish for the more exciting things they did just still on a weekly basis because it's nice to go into work and talk about how things are developing and uh you know, it's nice to kind of like, oh, yeah, did you watch The Witcher? Yeah, I watched all eight episodes. Oh, I've watched half an episode. Well, we can't really fucking talk about it there, can we? <laughs> right. But if we were doing this on week four of The Mandalorian and we had yeah. all, I don't know, had the discussion and gotten caught up, we'd be like, oh, well, you know, we're Tell no one's what, past four. <laughs> very, very handy for podcasters is the episodic weekly format. We could do an episode a week about a single, you know, episode. I uh, was going to try and yeah. do that. I tried to do a Good Place podcast with my friend Greg, who's been on uh, an Authors and Dragons at the movies. Uh, we never got the scheduling to work out. Well, you know, all those people out there in Radio Land who thinks this podcasting gig is easy. Huh. You don't know the half of it. Uh, blood, sweat, and tears. Blood, sweat, tears. The TV Klaus scheduling. Yes. The herding of cats. Yes. Semen. It's so much semen. I've got so what's after so TV, Steve? <laughs> oh, we get off we're, semen. Right. We're, okay. we're on cum. That means we're done with this. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, we are authors. I suppose we should probably talk about books, but I honestly don't think I've read a book that's been released this year that hasn't been by one of you guys. So That's okay. You can tell us how great we are. Well, I was talking about shingles specifically, and that's a difficult one to talk about. <laughs> that's fair. I've been on a bit of a nonfiction kick, um, and one of my favorites uh, that I read this year, I don't know if it was released this year, I'm not going to care that much, um, is uh, Springfield Confidential, uh, which is uh, the story, um, da, 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 I want to make sure I'm getting it, it's by Mike Reese, uh, who is one of the creators of, like, the foundational creators of The Simpsons, Matt Groening, Al Jean, and Mike Reese. Um, he also did The Critic. And so it's just the story of, like, The Simpsons, the, like, The Golden Age, the spinoff to The Critic. Uh, I don't know. It's a lot of great, interesting history if you particularly care about that. And so that was a really fun mm. one. Oh, that does sound fun. Yeah. I do like the kind of like behind the scenes of pop culture things. It's always makes for very interesting reading and or watching. I suppose I probably maybe not exciting TV events of the year, but I do like the, uh, the toys that made us and the movies that made us, uh, I always kind of catch up with them around Christmas. Um, Just, it's not a, it's not a this year one, but if you have any interest in that kind of topic, the universal one I recommend is, uh, as you wish, the audiobook about the making of the Princess Bride. Um, you can get the regular one, but the audiobook is narrated by Carrie Elwes as the primary narrator. And then when most of the actors who are still alive uh, wrote their sections, they come in and do their own narration. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. So it's, so it's a joy to listen to. And it's exactly what you hope it is. It's so nice. It's so wonderful. Like, it's it doesn't take away from the movie. It's all about these great experiences these people had. 
um, these beautiful tales about Andre the Giant. Like it's it's a fucking joy. That, that, that annoys me because I would I would find it so much more amusing if it was just like a bitter Car- Harry Elwes. Just be like, and even now I'll be like trying to like I'll be looking at broccoli and people be like farm boy, be like fuck you. <laughs> Okay, then that's what everybody except Rick wanted. <laughs> I read a lot this year, and my favorite that I didn't publish was called Magic for Liars by Sarah Gailey. And it's the best urban fantasy I've read in years. It's fucking fantastic. The characters are delightfully broken. It's an a adult it's an adult protagonist set in a magical university setting so or magical high school setting so it checks my old x-men slash new mutants nerddom it's a murder mystery it's a family story it's beautifully written and gailey's always gailey's been one of my favorite authors since they came on the scene and this was their first um, full length full length novel release. They've done a couple of novellas before, and fuck, this is good stuff. So I really recommend Magic for Liars. And then Just everything I wrote, because I'm a whore. Yeah. Yes. I looked That's it up fair. and bought it while you were talking, John. <laughs> it does sound good, yeah. Yeah. Th- I think the majority of what I've read this year was didn't come out this year. Yeah, me too. And mm. I barely. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard of shingles, to do with books. Like you kind of get to, to them as you get yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to catch up on classics that I really should have read by now, but haven't. I finally got uh, round to reading shit. What's called Flowers for Algernon. And I kind of thought I knew the story because it's been kind of, it's like one of those Christmas Carol things. It gets rehashed all the times. One of my favorite rehashes was this Always Sunny in Philadelphia version. But I've never actually, <laughs> yes. I've never, I've never actually sat down and read the book and realized how fucking tragic it was and how oh, it's wonderfully so depressing. Written. And uh, I was listening to the audio book in my office, and I was like, oh, I'm going to start crying in my office, and then mm. people are going to think I've got some sort of fucking breakdown happening <laughs> it's just this really sad book yeah yeah like I, I, for the i read I, I never read i had read snippets before but never read the first thing but in order to prep for sense sensibility and sasquatch i read the entirety of sense and sensibility which pretty much told me why i hadn't read the full thing up until now <laughs> oh, Rick, you love making some enemies you do <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to read older stuff yeah. sometimes. Like I I have read a lot of classics because I made myself, but I mean, I love the story of Don Quixote. It is one of my all-time favorite literary characters and tales. It's not fucking easy to read something that was written like 17th century and translated yeah. all the time. And, uh, yeah. It's not the smoothest yeah. and most enjoyable process. And, and I'll be perfectly honest, I can understand why Pride and Prejudice is Jane Austen's like best known book. Because it kind of reads like, okay, there's just a narrative going on there. Honestly, Sense and Sensibility reads along the lines of, I'm just making this shit up as I go along. And when I hit a brick wall, I'm just going to introduce more characters and have them be... Suitably British and shit. <laughs> ah, yes, the George R. R. Martin approach of plot morning. I guess technically, doesn't that mean he's using the Jane Austen Ooh, approach? I don't know. Uh, I have no concept of time. All the, none of these people were released in 2019. That would that would be great. Know. George R. R. Martin's like, and all along, you know, you know, Game of Thrones has just been <laughs> sense and sensibility with a lot more brother fucking. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so other than, I guess, yeah, other than Flowers and Algernon, I chained the Game of Thrones series and uh, would recommend it for anyone who likes a bit of sword and sorcery and murder. Not quite as graphic as the TV show, which is a little bit disappointed about. I think the TV show was a bit sexier than the novels, but, uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, really the it. novels strange... like mentioned whores all the time but uh yeah but they kind of just mention them in passing they don't sit yeah but i mean the whores in the show are talking. walking around in passing but you know, their titties are flapping around i seem to remember an entire scene where little just looking at some whores getting on it was like <laughs> that wasn't in the book 
Well, they were, it was in passing. That's uh, <laughs> you know, it was it was happening. We, you know, there are certain things I don't want to rely on my imagination for, Bevan, and uh, horse is one of. <laughs> I want that stuff spelled out to me. You might uh, be looking in the wrong genre. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know me, Joe. I like to be awkward. Like I'm sure those awkward. books are there, buddy. <laughs> no, I don't believe you. Let me check on the internet. Oh, holy shit! <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, other than Chain and Game of Thrones and Flowers for Algernon and a couple of other classics I've been meaning to catch up, I don't think I have read a single book that's been released in 2019 that wasn't a shingles. I don't know what that says about me or the state of state of literature today. It's it's uh, shingles or nothing. <laughs> Everything a else this year has been shit. A fair <laughs> chunk of the stuff I read this year won't release until next year or the year after oh, well, john reads in the fucking future <laughs> uh, yeah baby <laughs> yeah it's like john, john's reading these great stories nice. he's like hmm this is awesome i'll release you in 2042 <laughs> <laughs> not too far off <laughs> all right then well we've had movies we had television we've had books How about video games yeah, I was just about to say, Ooh, dare we, are we hip enough to talk about video games? Can we get into that shit? Oh, I'm not. I played a lot of Mario Kart. <laughs> that was Still a fun game. Year. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, great game. Yeah, not 2019. Not right. uh, I played it in 2019, though. Well, there you go. I'm not Still sure it's good. my favorite of the year, but I've been playing a lot of Pokemon Sword uh, for the last few months. Excellent. Is that the one? Uh, are the British accents and Irish accents as offensive as I've been led to believe? So Pokemon oh. doesn't do voice acting. So there are no accents. There's just occasional slang. It's heavily implied in the writing of such, wasn't it? I've, I've, I, I read some sample dialogue from what was, I can only assume, was a very drunk Japanese person's interpretation of an Irish person. <laughs> okay, I, okay, Steve, I think what you're referencing is when the character art came out and people merged a lot of um, the, uh, the, the character with the red hair and the green um, beret thing as they just decided she was Scottish and then they used a bunch of funny Scottish Twitter jokes on the pictures as no, like a that's like, mean great. thing. This was, this was actual dialogue from the game that somebody showed me but uh. <laughs> see what, what they did with that i would have just went full balls out and just done it all like that just proper cockney go on and show us your pikachu you cunt it would have been great just fucking peaky blinders and uh <laughs> you know glaswegian fucking mental boys oh bring it on yeah i i learned pants was slang for bad um that yes. was a bunch of pants mate yeah. The thing that stuck out to me the most. Well, of course, when we say pants, we mean underwear. We live in very different worlds, Drew. Truly. I will say, had they let me handle the translation of Pokemon Sword, we would be live in a much more interesting <laughs> world. I'm not saying I'd make it a better game or it'd be a better world, but I'd be having a better time. And I think maybe two or three other people. <laughs> Sword Sword was really fun. It it definitely kind of felt thin compared to other games, like the wild area acting more as the fill in for an interesting story and side stuff to do. I don't know. It it was very enjoyable, but it kind of it definitely didn't feel like what you would expect the first console game of the biggest media franchise in the world to be, which it is by sales. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I'm still enjoying playing it, so you know. I might have to pick it up for the kids. <laughs> uh, the old quotation marks put in there. <laughs> Speaking of games that were great for the kids, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3. <laughs> How is that? Uh, I don't know what it is about Luigi's Mansion the game, but I don't even think theoretically they're good games. I just love them. I just love that uh, terrified... Italian plumber sneaking around these haunted locations and just, uh, you know, I like the fact that he's always terrified. I like the fact that he fights uh, undead people with vacuum cleaners. It's good. It's not, it's not really, it's full of interesting little puzzles and all the kind of vaguely 
you know, spooky exploration you'd expect from the other games. I don't think it's a massive departure from the other games. But uh, the other games were also very enjoyable. So there is a, there's kind of a lot more head-to-head mini-games than there, than there have been, which are fun. I haven't fully explored them yet. Um, so, yeah, I'll say Luigi's Mansion 3 is a game I have played that was released in 2019. <laughs> I've thought about picking that one up. No, it's it's fun. It's exactly if you enjoyed the first one, you'll definitely enjoy this. So that's that's my endorsement of it. I played Mario Odyssey this year. I, it didn't come out this year, but I played it and it was fun as shit. Yeah, I keep revisiting that. It's just it's very enjoyable to play. So it's, it's always like taking a little vacation when you pick up a good Mario game. Was this the year Joe discovered Breath of the Wild? He posts about it a lot. Yeah. No, that was. Yeah, it was. He was a bit behind the curve on that one, wasn't he? But he picked up Breath of the Wild and uh, had the same experience I think everyone else did who played Breath of the Wild, where for about three months of your life, it's nothing but Breath of the Wild. And then you realize you can't live in a video game because you're a grown man and you've got to go outside. And, you don't pick and up this is where I put on my Robert Bevan hat because <laughs> I picked up Breath of the Wild and didn't really give a shit. I, I I liked it. I just don't have time to play it. Yeah, I think it depends how much you're into like uh, watching a video game out Avatar cook mushrooms. <laughs> that answer is zero. Yeah. Well, for me, it, it turned out to be like 100% really enjoyed doing that. So I was surprised. Oh, man. Yeah, it's got me a little worried. I, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed playing it for the few minutes that I played it. And then I thought, oh, man, I got to get back to work. And uh uh, I don't want to be this adult. I want to. <laughs> yeah. I want to waste hours of my life and days of my life playing video games, but uh, just I can't do it. Yeah, I, mm. I, I just realized, like you know, that like you know, the game I was gonna say didn't come out in two thousand uh, two thousand nineteen, and now, now I'm looking at it, I'm like, the only game I gave a shit about, which came out in two thousand nineteen, that I wanted to play was Kingdom Hearts 3, and then when it finally came out, I realized I didn't give a shit about it that much, so I don't actually think I played any major <laughs> video games uh, that came out in 2019, which is really sad. I, I know I haven't, because I played Breath of the Wild, and I played Diablo 3, and I've been too cheap to pick up Borderlands 3. It's like drinking at an expensive bar, man. I, I want to be drunk, but... I- Oh, I can't enjoy it at these prices. <laughs> yeah, so I'm waiting until midway through next year when the version of Borderlands 3 with all the downloadable content is like 30 bucks, and I'll buy it then. Yeah, and, and all fairness, like, you know, like after I would get out of, like, you know, finish my, like, writing and stuff for the day, I didn't want to be put in control of anything most of this year. I was just, and there was so much good streaming stuff. I was just like, you know, fuck it, I'll just watch another movie or I'll, like, you know, I'll, you know, Check out season three of Clara Santa Clarita Diet or something. So yeah, I think I think a lot of this year was just like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to deal with anything. I just want to stare my eyeballs at something, and that's it. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm gonna. Th- this is absolutely not 2019, but since I don't have a lot to contribute, I'm gonna offer this. Um, last night, my 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 kids got a uh, the board game Catan for Christmas, and um, I had never played it before. I've heard wonderful things about it, so I got it for them, and we've played it for the first time last night, and it was a blast, and I'm looking forward to playing again as soon as we get off this podcast. (laughs) It's a very fun game. I've heard good things about it, but I've never played it. I have to pick it up. Although, worth pointing out, very much not a video game or release this year. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I was going broader with games right. and we, we I did a say birth. that I, it was not released this year it's a and, game and it, fuck it's... you <laughs> Here, no, so fair. not released this year but uh, Steve and I've got one we did uh, this year The Adventure Brodia where we started playing World of Warcraft yeah See, I'm going to say that counts because that was broadcast this year yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I think we'll the most Steve. next year. Mm. I think the most exciting video game event of 2019 
was definitely me frustratingly learning how to play World of Warcraft. I think the major event was you deleting your Hearthstone, which I did not know could be done. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to be able to do that. I think this is a special kind of magic failure that only I was <laughs> capable of. <laughs> Midway through the episode, we realized Steve has basically done the video game equivalent of loses keys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. Uh, I don't know. I, we didn't really push it that much on the podcast that we were doing that. So if you are unaware of the Adventure Brodeo, that's on our YouTube channel. I think there's about six episodes up there. Um, we took a sabbatical while I learned how uh, to work computers. So uh, we'll be back next year with more Adventure Brodeo, which will probably be the most exciting video game event of 2020, I'm sure. Mm. I can't really think of anything I'm looking forward to in 2020. Oh, the new Shantae game uh, comes out. If you like a old school 2D Metroidvania platformer, uh, those are a lot of fun. Mm. Have you ever noticed every time we do this, and we've done a couple of these now, whenever we get to video games, we always just get a little bit sad about how we don't have time to play video yeah. games anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good to have traditions, I guess. Well, you know what? I'll make that one of my resolutions. Uh, in 2020, I want to spend more time playing video games. Yeah, my my wife gets on the kids about it, and, I, and I'm all like, you stop that right now. Let them enjoy <laughs> this. Yeah, my, 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 yeah, my oldest is almost 20, and, like, you know, every so often, like, you know, it's like, man, I want to go do, do this, but I don't have time. Like, welcome to life. <laughs> <laughs> life looks at the things you want to do and says that's nice here's responsibility <laughs> well i did try out a uh, virtual reality um game kind of like an event game today where you kind of like go and book and you all uh, kind of go in the booths and you play joint games together and i've got to say uh i am looking forward to being old and infirm because I'm just you know, going to say, look, give me a feeding tube, plug me into virtual reality, and uh, <laughs> you know that's how I want to die. I was really <laughs> impressed by it. It's kind of they put the goggles on me, and I knew I was in a room, and I told myself intellectually I was in a room. But as soon as they put the goggles on me, I felt my entire body just kind of go, all right, we're on the ledge of a building now. And I thought, oh, this is great. Also terrifying, but great. So much potential there. I think VR is mm. just going to go from strength to strength. I hope it's oh, yeah. good enough to uh, save me from the miseries of old age. Yeah, I've, I've, I did a little VR in, uh, in this year, and yeah, you're right. And and I think the pla the place that's really going to, like, you know, I think going to either cause you to, like, you know, just really enjoy it or just shit yourself is VR horror. Oh, Jesus. Because it's like, there's no escape there. You can't turn away from it. <laughs> I love yeah. horror, and there is nothing in me that wants to fuck with VR horror. <laughs> I went on, the the things I did were kind of like demo games. One was a shooting gallery, and it was great. It really did feel like I was just dual-wielding pistols at zombies, but they were kind of like cartoon zombies, so it wasn't scary. The other one was a uh, flight simulator, and that was cool. It was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to point this bird into the ocean. Oh, God, this is genuinely terrifying. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, I did do a kind of, it was like, it was kind of an on-rails horror walkthrough. And it was very at atmospheric, but there was a, it wasn't very interactive and it was a bit made with family audiences in mind. But I reckon, yeah, as far as pushing the boundaries of uh, survival horror goes, VR is a definite logical next step. Yeah, I mean, I, I had Resident Evil 5 and uh, there's a VR mode for that. It's kind of low res and it's, the, the controls make it a little bit nausea inducing, but yeah, th there's, there's like one or two scenes I played where like, you know, character just jumps in your face and like, you know, in the VR, that's a whole lot more visceral than, uh, than 10 feet away on a TV screen. <laughs> yeah. I bet. Oh, I bet. I played a little bit of the, um, the star Wars VR thing at, at a con and I was really blown away by how good it has gotten. Hmm. Yeah, it seems to be there now. It seems to be on that tipping point of viable investment, mm. which 
which where they've been trying to get to since I was like eight years old, but have never quite managed it. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think. I think especially if like Sony comes out with like a, a next gen VR for the, for the PlayStation one that's not just like an obvious add on, um, yeah, I, th- I think I think this is like kind of the potentially the next uh, the next big thing in uh, in gaming. There, do you want to know how you know to really take to make it take off? Dick attachment is standard. <laughs> Once they do that, yep. that's it. No one's leaving their house ever again. I don't want to go. I don't want to go and visit Grandpa. He's always in VR. <laughs> I mean, you joke, but truly porn is probably the thing that will push the technology forward. It oh, is yeah, historically yeah. the thing that always does push technology forward. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely 100% serious. As soon as they get the groinal attachments for yeah. these bad boys, that's it. The human race is going to die out yeah. in the best way yeah. possible. <laughs> it's going to fuck itself yeah. to death. And, it, and it's great for everybody involved because it's great for the people who are in the VR and the people who are outside just watching the other person make a complete ass of themselves in the real world. It's hilarious as well. <laughs> no, no, they're nude. It's not. My son wanted you know, some VR shit for Christmas. And I, I was thinking, it's not, it's not ready yet. Um, I'm going to give it another year to see where it goes cuz right now I don't I don't think the the state of it is is worth the worth the price you pay and and I would have had to get another video game system <laughs> cuz you know, right, here's the biggest disappointment I I looked into uh what what VR options the Switch and um had available and it's that fucking cardboard shit they're doing like what is it called labo uh, the labo <laughs> labo what is that the switch about? isn't powerful enough for vr that's why yeah well yeah. whatever i mean i mean just you know give me plastic the best thing they can do is that <laughs> you just mask and tape the screen to yeah, your face exactly what is this whole labo thing <laughs> how how is nintendo proud of this I think it's called a cardboard victory lab. fucking shit <laughs> They sold so many Switches, they were like, you know what? One stupid launch for fun. You know what would really improve your video game experience? This cardboard. Suckers. Oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm insulted. Quest. I have heard those are supposed to be pretty good VR. Yeah. My, my, my oldest, it, it, and it just broke actually this week, but he had one of those uh, Microsoft augmented reality headsets, and he played the fuck out of it. Like games like Beat Saber. There's this, there's this arena fighting game that, that he had that he just has a million mods for that like you know that you just walk in there and just hear him like like just chuckling the shit out of each other as he's flailing his arms and crap you know so (laughs) apparently apparently like if you have a decent enough pc like right now consoles not really but if you have a powerful enough pc apparently vr is not bad yeah if you're willing to spend a lot of time and money on a sufficient rig you probably get a good experience out of it but as for like you know out of the box console vr solutions no Bevan, you're probably right it's not there mm. yet yeah hopefully so it's just uh, make do with your cardboard no well, i'm not buying like i'm this. not paying that money for fucking cardboard <laughs> i i'm insulted that nintendo thinks so little of me that i'm gonna pay this money fucking cardboard cutouts that's oh it, it hurts me <laughs> well again um I, d- I haven't looked into it, but the Quest is supposedly the one that is a lot of this stuff. It's a self-sustaining headset that you can hook up to a more powerful PC um, if you want to go in depth, and it like you can do pass through. It can see around you. Like I've heard that that is like the first like step toward what we all kind of think VR should be, but I don't know anybody who's actually had enough money to fuck with it. And, and your yeah, the other option is here's your cardboard helmet and your cardboard dick holster. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the Quest, the Oculus Quest is what I played on. It's oh, shit. awesome. Yeah. I could just imagine my Bevin game just... store where I played, where I play Magic, has a rig that they go to cons and they charge people, I don't know, like five bucks for five minutes or five bucks for 10 minutes. And it's fucking fantastic. Especially for them. Yeah. yeah. All right, rich people, get a Quest. Tell us what you think. Hmm. I'm still uh I'm still thinking about Robert Bevan just 
wandering around his living room with a cardboard box on his head and a flashlight <laughs> kind of <laughs> gaffer taped to his cargo shorts. Just living, <laughs> living the Screaming, fucking dream. Fuck you, Nintendo. <laughs> I'm never coming back to the real world. <laughs> 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 oh the future's wonderful isn't it great to be in the future yeah I don't think we're topping that image <laughs> actually as this is releasing we are in the new year because this is our new year's day episode right that's right yep. yes oh look forward to strangers thing ah or, yeah, don't look, don't look forward to it for the new year you should probably explain that's a shingles Rather yeah. than just you know, <laughs> like a dire prediction for, <laughs> for your day. Yeah, so if this releases on New Year's Day, within the last 48 hours, Bevan and I have both released new books. Because oh. Inflection Point, the sixth Quincy Harker novel, will is rele- released on the 31st on New Year's Eve. There we go. Already a fantastic start to the year. And that's an end Bevan, to the year. And Bevan's released Stranger's Thing. Bevan that's has right. let go of Stranger's Thing. <laughs> Bevan has unveiled Stranger's Thing. Stranger's Thing. There, 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 Bevan there is something sh- for our more enterprising, uh, you know, listeners. Make Shingles VR a thing. <laughs> oh, oh, don't God. do that. Oh, oh my God, no! I think that's don't don't start with Stranger's nightmare. Thing. <laughs> Oh God! Uh, I'll, I'll I'll plug something that's not nightmare porn. Um, <laughs> ah, the uh, the underqualified advice audiobook comes out this month, uh, January twenty eighth. Kirby Hayborn uh, will be reading that off, and then exactly one month later, February twenty eighth, you can hear him again uh, as Fred Number Six, Undeading Bells, releases on audiobook. Awesome. Well, on January 9th, you can also pick up Everyday Horrors: Bill of the Dead Two. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll probably hopefully have a, an audio book date not too long after. When's, uh, when's Shingles Volume 3 release? February 18th. February? Uh, that's still a while mm. then. Okay. Yeah, but it yeah. is in 2020. So yeah. 2020, yeah. February 18th. Mm. Shingles 3. Come and get it. Nice. Yeah, I don't know if I've got anything. I uh, know I've got a lot on during the new year. It's going to be a busy year for me. An exciting year. But I don't know if I've actually got anything released or uh, released. Actually, Steve would like to talk about the Doomsayer Journeys Omnibus Edition. <laughs> of, there you go. <laughs> available now in ebook, paperback, and hardcover from Falstaff Books, Excellent. as well yeah. as the upcoming Doomsayer Journeys Omnibus Audio Book, which should be coming out very soon. There you go. The I, paperbacks just delivered to my house yesterday. God damn, that's a chonky ass book. Nice. That is yeah. a thick paperback. If you want, you know, a way to keep yourself entertained and to maybe also kill a rat, then the uh, the Doomsday <laughs> Omnibus hardback edition is for you. Entertaining, murder potential for small animals. Um, yeah. I don't know why else I can tell you about it. Maybe you can curl it, kind of work on your gun show. Ah, yeah, it's going to be great. You should get that. <laughs> okay, it's 2019. I think uh, a, a good year for geek media in general. Uh, lots to enjoy. Uh, lots of shingles releases all over the bathroom wall. Uh, and yeah, and to, let's hope for more of the same in 2020. More excitingly divisive uh, conversations about things that don't really matter that much. Uh, and more enjoyable television and more shingles releases. I think we can all agree that that is something to look forward to. Daybreak sucks. <laughs> <laughs> God. Well, you'll get more of this content in 2020. Uh, yep. In the meantime, uh, oh, oh, but well, oh, there's, there's one, well, there's one, you, there's one thing we we forgot. <laughs> you know, I don't know if we want to at least release it now, but one thing very much to look forward to in, in 2020: Authors and Dragons Con two. Oh, holy shit! Yeah, how did we forget yeah. about that? 
I mean, uh, why would you forget about that? For those of you who went to Orphans and Dragons Con 2019, I think everybody had a really fucking great time. I'm sure we've mentioned that on this I podcast think. before. Yeah, well, you fuckers are busy. Hey, I'm daybreak. I'm like taking care of business here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah uh, look up on our Facebook look up on our website for further information about Authors and Dragons Con 2020 we want to do the same but different we want to do a a new location Uh, we want to open up to hopefully the people who couldn't make Vegas in 2019 hopefully you will be able to make this one we want to see more of you there we want to see the people who were there last time we want to see you guys again we had a good time and I want you to bring me birthday presents motherfuckers Yes, and John also wants free presents from I, yes. I do too. My birthday is in January. I will accept them late. <laughs> yes, I will accept <laughs> early birthday presents. Uh, if you want to give us things, uh, Authors and Dragons Con 2020 is the perfect venue for you to do so. <laughs> or, uh, or just show up and actually have a good time. <laughs> Yeah, you can do that. You don't yeah, have to that too. Him. Whatever. You Get selfish pricks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's been an exciting year. It's been a good year for the podcast. Uh, please do stay with us for next year where we'll have more ludicrous analysis of uh, geek-relevant bullshittery and uh, long conversations about Amazon monopolies as well. Maybe some more of that. And, of course, our continuing adventures with the Authors and Dragons main episodes. Uh, If you'd like to support us further, check out our Patreon. Uh, If you don't follow us on Facebook, go follow us on Facebook. We, uh, you know... And and on on YouTube, subscribe. And on YouTube, like Mm -hmm. Facebook.com Facebook.com slash slash Authors and Dragons, Patreon.com slash Authors and Dragons, YouTube.com slash Authors and Dragons. We're, if nothing else, consistent. Smash yes. that subscribe button. And if, and if you don't like follow us in any of those places, you're not hearing this anyway, so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not listening to this podcast, please consider doing so. If you're sitting in a dentist's office and this is just playing and you're hearing it, your dentist you is should awesome. Get health insurance. You God should email damn. us because I want to know about that dentist. That seems like a yeah. cool dentist. I think maybe you find a different dentist. <laughs> but, you know, definitely listen to the podcast, but find a different dentist. <laughs> Until then, bye. 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 Bye.